I invite you to turn to James chapter 4 with me. But let me set up what we're going to do today because um, if you've noticed in your bulletin, in your outline, there's quite a lengthy outline for you. And, and I know that you are well aware that normally I can't make it through three or four points. And if you look at that, you may think, wow, we're going to be here a couple of hours maybe. But um, let, me, let me just t tell you this. The outline you have in front of you isn't original to me. I almost never, ever do that because when I step into the pulpit and bring the Word of God, I want it to be fresh from the Lord to me to you. But this outline is part of my study on prayer. And when we begin to tackle James chapter 4, we're going to tackle the issue of prayer. And in fact, James continues with that issue even on into chapter 5. So what I want to do today, given the fact that we have a limited time uh, for the preaching because we're going to have the supper, I want to whet your appetite, if you will. I want to give you a, a bit of a teaser for when we really get into to chapter 4, first three verses, and begin to kind of pull these things apart. I want us to have more time to talk about some of the details that James is trying to help us understand about what it means to grow in our spiritual maturity and especially to grow in the power of prayer. As I study on prayer, one of the great classics of the Christian faith on prayer is a book by R.A. Torrey. And for that reason, I've included in your outline today the outline of chapter 1 in R.A. Torrey's incredible work called How to Pray. R.A. Torrey may not be a name that you're very familiar with. He was a pastor, an evangelist, a college president. In fact, he was the, the founding uh, president of Moody Bible Institute now Moody College, as well as Biola University in California. And he was a prolific writer of more than 40 books, one of which is this classic on the issue and the power of prayer, originally published in 1900. Now, there may be a word or two here in this outline that you may look at and, see it and you'll say, you know what, that, that is maybe from 1900 because that's how they would have, that's how they would have worded something back in, in the day. But what I want you to know is, is that what R.A. Torrey had to say about prayer over a hundred years ago is just as really meaningful to us today. And I'm going to go ahead and read. Um, I don't know, in your outline, I, I didn't change the, uh, the scripture verses at the top. That should be James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. So I apologize for that. But here we go. James chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And then I'm going to take just a few minutes to run through this outline. And you'll see the significance of prayer. And then you'll be prepared for next week when we dive in a little more deeply into this issue. James writes, From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it 
upon your lusts. Bow with me for a moment to pray. Father, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word. God, illumine our hearts, our minds, to be able to hear this word today, to receive it, and to uh, begin to allow the importance of prayer to, to grow deeply that we would be a praying people, that we would be a people so intimately acquainted with you through prayer, that we are walking in the Spirit every moment of every day of our lives. Lord, help us as we look at these important principles of prayer. Live it every day in our lives. We would gain a closer walk with you in Jesus. Amen. The beginning of his book, the beginning of chapter 1, R.A. Torrey asks a question. In fact, he sets it up. He says, prayer, if you follow Jesus and how he prayed, you will find that, that prayer is to be, and he uses these words over and over and over again, prayer is to be constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming. So why should prayer be constant, persistent, sleepless, and overcoming? Why, why do we have a great need for that? Well, here from Dr. Torrey's study of God's Word are some reasons why we've got to be a people of prayer and be more people of prayer than what we already are. And no matter how much praying you do, you're not doing enough yet. Because I know I'm not. First of all, reason number one, because there's a devil. Why do we need to be praying? Because we have an enemy. He is cunning. He is mighty. He never rests. He's ever plotting the downfall of the children of God. And if the children of God relax in prayer, the devil will succeed in ensnaring him. We ought to be a people of prayer because we've got an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. We need to be a people of prayer. And then he says that the second reason for this constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer is that prayer is God's appointed way for obtaining things. And the great secret of all lack in our experience, in our life, in our work, is neglect of prayer. And when Tory deals with this issue, he goes directly to James chapter 4 our text. And he says, you have not because you ask not. God has given us a formula for having the things that, that we need from him in life and it's by prayer. And we don't have because we neglect prayer. Next week we'll deal more uh, you know, more fully with that issue in, in these verses from our text. But a third reason, a third reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer is that those men who God set forth as a pattern of what he expected Christians to be, the apostles, they regarded prayer as the most important business of their lives. And then Tory turns to Acts chapter 6. When in the early church, some problems began to arise, some, some, some complaints arose within the church, some people were being neglected, not cared for, certain things. And, and if you know that chapter, you know the story there. And the, the people began to, to come to the apostles and say, you know, we, we need help with this issue. And the apostles say, listen, there's a way to deal with this. But we, on our part, we've got to do the most important thing, and that's to not neglect the word and prayer. In fact, they put it in the opposite order, prayer and the word. 
prayer came first and then the word. And then we know that the apostles told the church by the, the, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that they were to, to select out those seven men. So, it was the most important business of the apostles, and they were the ones who Jesus set apart to, to pour his life into and as an example to us. But not only that, number four, there's still a weightier reason for this constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer. And it's this, that prayer occupied a very prominent place and played a very important part in the earthly life of our Lord Jesus. Prayer was important to Jesus. And as the Son of God, you would think, what does he need prayer for? He's the Son of God. He can just do whatever he needs to do. But Jesus knew that even his miraculous power even the wisdom that he had, he had to be in constant communion with the Father. And how, how much more we, not being the Son of God, how much more we need that prayer and that constant communion with our Father to do the work that he's called us to do. But the next one, number five, is simply this. There is another reason for constant persistent, sleepless, uh, coming prayer, and that's this. Prayer is the means, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, prayer, praying is the most important part of the present ministry of our risen Lord. Now get that. Prayer is the most important part of the present ministry of our Lord. What is the present ministry of Jesus? Well, after he lived the, the 30 years on this earth, 33 years, uh, and the three years with, with his disciples and ministering, what did he do? He ascended to the Father. And what does Scripture tell us? That he is presently doing, interceding on behalf of who? You and me, the believers. So in fact, Jesus didn't give up praying when he left earth He's still doing it at the right hand of God, even right now. How important is prayer? That Jesus continues day and night to pray for his own. Intercessing before the Father on our behalf. Well, the sixth reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer is that prayer is, is uh, the means that God has appointed for our receiving mercy and obtaining grace to help in our time of need. Those are the words right out of Hebrews. When the writer of Hebrews says, we can boldly approach God's throne of grace. How do we do that? You, have you found some ladder to climb, climb to heaven like the, the ladder Jacob saw? You know, and, and the angels descending up and down and back and forth to heaven. Jacob's ladder. I haven't seen one of those lately. So I don't get to climb. How do I do that? By prayer. You pray to seek God's mercy. You pray for God's grace in your time of need. And you know what happens? God has promised that he will give it. When we pray, Next, next reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer is that prayer in the name of Jesus Christ is the way that Jesus Christ himself has appointed for his disciples to obtain fullness of joy. When James, or when Jesus in the Gospels said, I, I want you to be able to ask God for anything. You remember that? You ask for anything in my name. And in that text, Jesus says that what I'll do is I will fulfill or fill up to the fullness your joy. You need joy in your life? You get it by prayer. 
There's no other way. You receive joy from Jesus, the only kind that he can give, through prayer. The next reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer, number eight, is that prayer in every care and anxiety and need of life with that giving is the means that God has appointed for obtaining freedom from all anxiety and the peace of God which passes all understanding. That's Philippians chapter 4 for you. Pray with thanksgiving. Make your supplication be known to God with thanksgiving in your heart so that he can relieve you of the care, the anxiety. It, it, and it, because he says do it without any anxiety. The only way to get rid of that anxiety is to go to him with thanksgiving in your heart. And no going to provide for you. He's going to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus with the peace that surpasses all understanding. Number nine, the ninth reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer is that praying is the method that God himself has appointed for our obtaining the Holy Spirit. Now, we understand that when we are saved, at the moment of conversion, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter one, when you come to Christ, he gives you the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 4.30, he, he seals us with the presence of the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So we know that we get the Holy Spirit, but are we always filled up and overflowing with the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit? We're not. Because that's, that's the whole reason Paul writes Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, he says, look, you need to learn to walk in the Spirit and not walk in the flesh. Because we get consumed with the things of the flesh and, and that's what fills us. We, we get filled up with the things of the world and we need to learn how to be filled up to overflowing with the presence and power of the Spirit. How do you do that? Thank you. Somebody said it. We pray. We ask God. There's no other way. Tenth reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer is that prayer is the means that Christ has appointed whereby our hearts shall not be overcharged with, with uh, surfeiting. It's not a word we use a whole lot today. And drunkenness and cares of this life so that the day, in the, the day of Christ's return come upon us suddenly as a snare. We need to be in constant prayer so that our hearts are right before God and, 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 and the, the coming of the Lord doesn't slip up on us. Paul says, be children of, of the light. Or I'm sorry, John says that in 1 John. That we're children of the light. Paul says, awake out of darkness. Wake up for the, the day of the Lord is near. So be alert, be aware. Be awake and don't fall into the snare of the devil that will keep us from doing all that, that we need to be doing for the Lord because he's coming. And we're not to be, we shouldn't be surprised at his coming. Now, last thing is this. Number 11. There, there's one more reason for constant, persistent, sleepless, overcoming prayer. And it is a, a mighty reason, and here it is, because of what prayer accomplishes. Because of what prayer accomplishments accomplish. We've already had, said a whole lot about prayer. But let's add to that these four things about what prayer accomplishes in our lives as individuals, in the church, First, what does prayer accomplish? Prayer promotes our spiritual growth. As almost nothing else can, indeed as nothing else but Bible study and true prayer and true Bible study go, go hand in hand. So prayer coupled with Bible study promote our spiritual 
growth. What are we studying in James? Spiritual maturity. And you can't get that apart from prayer. Prayer accomplishes, with, along with the, the Word of God, spiritual growth and maturity in our lives. The second thing that is accomplished in prayer is that prayer brings power into our lives. What kind of power? God's power. There's not enough power in and of ourselves to, to do all that, that God has called us to do, to be all that God has called us to be. We need God's power, Holy Spirit power in our lives. And again, going back to, to praying for the Holy Spirit to, to fill up our lives, prayer brings power in our work. Third thing, prayer avails for the conversion of others. When R.A. Torrey wrote about this, he reflected on his own conversion experience. And he said, you know, when I first thought about my conversion, I thought, you know what, it's not because anybody prayed for me, it's just something that happened. He says, I, I was awakened in the middle of the night and the Holy Spirit of God was dealing with me in such a powerful way. I gave my life to Christ right there in, in uh, just in the middle of my sleep as I, I woke up and could not sleep another wink. He says, I gave my life to Christ. And it wasn't in some, some great evangelistic meeting. It wasn't in some prayer meeting. It wasn't in some preaching service. It, it was just there in my own the Holy Spirit came on me so heavy that I said yes to Christ and he forgave my sin. And so he said, at first I thought, you know, it's not because I was being prayed for. I was just there in my room asleep at night and then he began to realize how many times his mother had prayed for him throughout his lifetime. And later on in his preaching ministry, an old friend, an old college friend of his approached him and told him, he said, you know what, Tori, all, all that time you were, you were my roommate in college, I was praying for your salvation. And so he didn't know that. But because of the prayers of his mother, because of the prayers of this, of this friend, this college roommate, God was doing a powerful work in his life and he came to know Jesus. Prayer brings power to our work, but prayer brings conversion to others. Finally, prayer brings blessing to the church. Do we want God's blessing on our life? Do we want God's blessing on our family? Do we want God's blessing on our church? Well, the only way to accomplish that is in prayer. And we must be, we must be a praying people. Our church needs to be filled up on a Wednesday night when we have prayer gathering time. That really in and of itself ought to be a more powerful time in the church than, than Sunday morning in the pulpit. Because if you want power in the pulpit, it comes when we as a church are praying for it. When we're praying for our pastor, when we're praying for the preaching and teaching of the word of God from the pulpit in the Sunday school classes. There's a direct correlation between the power and persistency of our prayers and the power and persistent work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and our family and our church. And we have not because we ask not. Will you bow with me for a moment?